Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features The Uncanny X-Men number 334, cover dated July 1996. And this cover is by Joe Madureira, inked by Tim Townsend, featuring a trio of X-Men, Gambit and Bishop are down, and Jean Grey is facing off against the unstoppable return of Juggernaut. This was all set up in X-Men, that's adjectiveless X-Men number 53. And it's an interesting cover design. We've got the three characters more or less on a diagonal here, but something that you might miss unless you pay close attention to the background is that the Juggernaut is outlined in shadow, in a big shadow that he's casting here. So it's very subtle. You might miss it on a first glance, but it's there in the image and it looks really well. So let's open this one up to the splash page which also features the Juggernaut. As you can see, there's 22 pages of story in this issue. It's still part of the prologue buildup to the big reveal of just who exactly the X-Trader is and the true identity of Onslaught. Juggernaut knows who Onslaught is, but that information is locked behind um, some buried part of his memory. So he's come to Westchester, he's come to the X-Mansion, in order to get help in remembering who truly is Onslaught. Title of this story is Dark Horizon and the creative team is Scott Lobdell writer, Joe Madureira pencils, Tim Townsend on inks, and then Steve Buccellato and Team Booch on digital colors and lettering, digital lettering by Richard Starkings and Comicraft. Now something else to note before getting into the story again here is the fact that this particular issue, which is still, it's supposed to be the deluxe edition of the comic, the paper quality has changed. So no longer do we have the glossy stock paper. Instead, it's returned to newsprint, but it is a higher quality newsprint than the one used back in the 1980s or early 90s. But the glossy paper is gone and that is an indication of a cost saving maneuver or device on, on part of the bean counters at Marvel. And we're getting into the middle of 1996. The comics speculator bubble has burst and comic sales are going down, down, down. And this is also the moment with Onslaught for the um, Marvel trying something by bringing Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee to the company to revamp um, some of their mainstay characters, Rob Liefeld, for example, revamping Captain America and Jim Lee revamping the Fantastic Four. So comics were in trouble and Marvel was in trouble in the mid-90s. This is that time period and hence the change in quality of the paper stock for this particular issue and issues coming in the future. So anyway, the Juggernaut, here he is. It turns out he's in Breakstone Lake and um, he's in a mean mood. Come on, come on already, you losers. So is he being faced by a gang of X-Men? What's going on? Let's turn the page. And it turns out, no. He is in Breakstone Lake and he is keeping an eye on the boathouse, which is the residence, the married residence of Scott Summers and Jean Grey. So he says here to himself, like I got nothing better to do than wait around waiting for Cyclops and Jean Grey to come home. I should just go up and bang on their door. Should, but I won't. What's my problem, he asks himself as he sinks into the water. And this recalls from me, at least anyway, you'll find the review of Amazing Spider-Man number 229 um, in the back catalogue of Comics Bazaar, is that Juggernaut, with that helmet of his, despite the eye holes and the opening around his nose and mouth, uh, his Juggernaut costume, the powers that the Gem of Sidorak, his encounter with the Gem of Sidorak, has given him means that he doesn't seem to have to breathe underwater, um, or at least he can maybe hold his breath um, seemingly indefinitely. Um, so that's an interesting thing because that's what he does in um, Amazing Spider-Man 229 as well. When he jumps off a yacht um, owned by Black Tom Cassidy and makes his way underwater uh, to the southern tip of Manhattan, apparently without needing to breathe. Anyway, Juggernaut continues thinking to himself, this really nice use of the digital coloring effects here for the bubbles 
um, of air that he displaces from um, tumbling or not tumbling but sinking down into the water at Breakstone Lake he thinks there my entire life I wanted something I took it something was in my way I plowed over it I ain't been afraid of nothing my whole life leastways not until now until onslaught so this really is building and building and building onslaught as this huge threat to the x-men because if the unstoppable juggernaut is um you know stopped at least emotionally in his tracks by someone like onslaught well then that really sells to readers how significant onslaught is but the x-men aren't dummies and they've got underwater surveillance um in the lake so juggernaut spots the camera and he thinks that means one of my stepbrother's stupid mutant flunkies will be down here in a flash but he decides that he is in a position to destroy the camera before it pans and spots him so that gives him an opportunity to smash some underwater rocks and um, he thinks to himself this is fairly comical i love 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 smashing things if only it was this easy to pound on onslaught the thing that nearly killed me a while back and that's a reference to uncanny x-men 322 but then that's why i'm here he thinks to unlock the secret of onslaught a secret i got floating in my head but he can't access it it's behind a mental block in his mind likely placed there by onslaught but really great opening three page sequence by joe Maderera. his art is really on top notch form in this particular issue really fine sensitive detailed inking too by tim townsend um great work by uh the penciler and inker collaborators then the scene shifts to inside the x mansion the whole story takes place at night and bishop is working on a um the mutant tracking cerebro unit that uh, was wrecked in X-Men number 51. And he has an interesting thought to himself as he's working on this contraption. He thinks, this is all somewhat disconcerting. Much of the technology utilized in this device is almost identical to that used a century from now. So that's in his own time. But how's that possible? What could have happened that would stunt the development of technology to such an extreme degree? And the reader must think to themselves, well, is it the coming of Onslaught? Um, and is that the reason that there was no technological advances? In any case, Bishop here is interrupted by Gambit. Well, not interrupted, but helped by Gambit, Gambit um, who gives him the, uh, the tool that he's looking for. And Bishop, in surprise, calls out his name, Remy. And that gives Gambit an opportunity to have a little fun at Bishop's expense. Did you just call me Remy, not Gambit, not LeBeau? For the first time since you dropped into this century you call me remy you're trying to make me blush so that's a little funny scene there and of course these two have been paired by lobdell in particular over the last uh, few months as a type of um, odd couple and um, bishop is warming up to gambit because of all the time they've spent together he's beginning to trust him and his suspicions about gambit as the ex-trader are beginning to fall into abeyance Bishop says, maybe I'm just happy in my own way. And that is unusual for Bishop. And it all has to do with the fact that hes um, it's been revealed in the encounter with Mr. Sinister in X-Men 52 that Bishop isn't going mad. So Sinister was able to pull out all those memories that had been floating around in Bishop's head. And Bishop says, granted, he's not the most reliable source in the world, that's Sinister. But he seemed as surprised as I was at those thoughts. True, I'm no closer to figuring out what it all means. And those are his memories of the age of apocalypse but it is reassuring in a small way to know i'm not going insane weird ain't it what's that asked bishop and gambit says something interesting here and it's all part of these little clues being laid as to the true identity of onslaught that professor x wasn't able to help you sort things out here he is the most powerful telepath on the face of the planet yet yeah. and they're interrupted by the security system the intruder alarm is going Bishop is tasked with, above all, um, um, the security detail at the X-Mansion. Just as well, Gambit, he says, I didn't like where you were heading, you know, with what Gambit was insinuating about the professor not helping Bishop with those memories um, or the trouble in his mind. So Bishop asks the computer for a status report and the security alert is in sub-aqua five. So that's the lake. 
and Bishop sees that there's no trace of mutant activity. Now that's a nice little detail because you know, readers might forget that Juggernaut is not a mutant. He is Professor X's stepbrother, but is not a mutant. He has his powers by virtue of the gem of Sidorak. It's kind of um, a quasi-magical uh, gem that has given him those powers of the Juggernaut. So Bishop thinks, or says rather to Gambit, it's probably just some debris in the lake clogging the camera. Gambit asks as he flashes his cards, want to check it out, or sorry, uh, Bishop asks Gambit, want to check it out? And Gambit flashes the cards. Cards, you have to ask. But the scene switches to the danger room and Cyclops is working out against not Shi'ar holograms, but rather real uh, mechanical um, um, obstacles and dangers, you know, evoking the way that the danger room worked uh, back in the Stan Lee and Jack Kirby days. And you know, I read an interview recently with Scott Lobdell where he was saying that he hated um, the, um, the Danger Room uh, when it was used. And he didn't mention Claremont's name, but he was referencing Claremont really without mentioning his name. When the Danger Room and the holograms were used to kind of sell the reader on the idea that the X-Men were in X environment when it was just a training session, let's say. So, you know, that was a trope of um, Claremont's run. Lobdell said that he hated that and um, in his view he never used uh, the Shi'ar hologram uh, danger room during his run, during all of his run. Now I don't think that's 100% the case, but you can see it here, Cyclops not um, using the holograms. Um, and then um, it's like one of these uh, guns gets the drop on him and then it explodes. A widget exploding behind me, I didn't even see it. And it's Jean, and she's back from her clothes shopping in X-Men number 53, and also her encounter with Onslaught on the astral or psionic plane. And she says to her husband, Scott, we have to talk. Computer M program, he uh, orders immediately. And you can see that Jean, um, even though she was quite perturbed and disturbed by her unexpected encounter with Onslaught, has remembered to bring her shopping bags with her because of course she's gonna need some new clothes. You can see how shredded they are after that encounter. But Jean countermands Cyclops order. Computer, no, belay that command, continue program. And then she creates a TK bubble around them. Jean, what's going on, asks Scott. I know your telekinetic, a telekinetics can protect us, but why talk here, what happened to you? And so she reveals to Scott, I saw him, him onslaught. He spoke to me, Scott, he wanted me to join him. That's a great upshot of Cyclops and Phoenix standing in her telekinetic bubble there. Really nice angle that Madarera has picked out. He's able to draw at any anything at this point in his, what has been a short career of only uh, three or four years. And he's 22 only at this point, And he is like a master of his craft already a young master of his craft. Really, really great work by him. So Gene asks or, or responds to Cyclops' question, join him how? He didn't say, that is, I don't think he said. The whole conversation took place on the psionic plane. With every moment that passes, I remember less and less. And Cyclops suggests, suggests and it seems like, you know, common sense, then we need to get you to the professor so he can, and she exclaims, no. Scott, not yet, I'll talk to him in the morning, I promise. I just need a little time to think, just a little time, because one of the things that Onslaught revealed to Jean Grey was um, a repressed memory in Professor X's mind, in his psyche, in his unconscious, uh, taken from X-Men number three, the Stan Lee and Jack Kirby issue, where Professor X thought to himself how much he loved Jean Grey while she was a 16-year-old teenager and that has rattled Jean. It rattled Jean the, um, in issue 53 of X-Men. It's rattling her here, even though her memories are fading. And so trust has been broken. So it's really interesting and it's all part of, you know, the uh, kind of hints as regards the true identity of on Onslaught. Meanwhile, the scene switches to the Rocky Mountain, Colorado, Erie of uh, Warren Worthington the third, AKA Archangel. He's recovering from wounds sustained fighting against uh, Sabretooth. And Psylocke two is also recovering from wounds sustained against, um, or in a fight with Sabretooth, but she's been healed by her 
um, uh, draft of the Crimson Dawn, but it's left her with this interesting face to two. And she herself is wondering about what has happened uh, to her since she was exposed to the Crimson Dawn. But the chief concern here in the plot is they can't make contact with the X-Mansion. So Archangel concludes something's definitely wrong. What do you say, Psylocke, up for a trip to Westchester? So Psylocke and Archangel are making their way to the X-Mansion. Really, something I want to note before moving on from this page is that Madurera does a really great version of um, Psylocke that really sends you, sells you on the fact that she is in an Asian, specifically Japanese body. So you can really see that in the way he's drawing her um, anatomy, her stature, stature, as well as her physiognomy, the physiognomy of her face. Um, and he does a very good job of it. So then, uh, speaking of Professor X, that's a nice little establishing shot of the window outside his um, sitting room. And inside you've got uh, Cannonball, who is the newest member of the X-Men and who has been fouling up as such and who has grave doubts about whether he should continue as an X-Man. And we've got Professor X in his Shi'ar wheelchair just getting warmed by uh, in front of the log fire there, the open log fire. Really, really great drawing, great spotting of blacks, great casting of shadow from that light source of the log fire. There's no other lights on in the room very atmospheric and so Sam says to the professor um, that he feels like he's just holding everyone back by staying on as an X-Man then leave says the professor and Sam's taken by surprise do you have any idea of the degree of problems we face on a daily basis Sam says the professor the sentinels evil mutants raging packs of paranoid humans the legacy virus there are young mutants being beaten to death practically on our very doorstep. And that's a reference back to um, X-Men Prime, the first issue back from the Age of Apocalypse, where a young mutant was beaten to death and the professor couldn't get there in time. He sent his astral form to comfort the young man as he was dying, but was unable to arise, arrive physically or the X-Men in order to save him from the mob. Are you that self-important? that with everything else I have on my mind, I'm supposed to be concerned with your probably justifiable feelings of inadequacy? That's harsh. Sir, I never thought, says a very taken aback, um, Sam. No, you didn't. We have a goal here, Sam, to save this world while there's still a world left. If you'd rather play at being the young radical and cause a lot of sound and fury with Cable and X-Force while doing nothing of any merit, go do that. If you want to be an X-Man, if you want to stand for something, then enough of your whining and get back to the job at hand. So the professor has lost patience with uh, the doubts of um, young X-Men like Cannonball. I trust we won't be having this conversation again. Cannonball chastens says, no, sir, we won't. And he walks off in silence. Another great page there, more great spotting of blacks and casting of shadow. The room is mostly in shadow, as you can see. Only the light source of the log fire illuminating anything there. Great choice here to focus in on Cannonball's feet as he walks away. And the professor left almost in complete darkness there too. Um, good, good stuff. Outside, uh, Bishop and Gambit have arrived at the lake on this cool Shi'ar water sled. And they're there hovering around looking for a threat. Any readings yet, asks Gambit. According to the scanner, if anything's down there, says Bishop, it's categorically not a mutant. So remember, Juggernaut's not a mutant. Maybe your optimism is well-founded, Remy. Mon Dieu, he exclaims. What is it, Gambit? It's, and you can see here, if you're looking at this in high definition, it's the Juggernaut. You can see him under the water as he's about to emerge and attack Gambit, and Gambit's charged up the pack of cards there, telekinetically on instinct. And here, what a great shot. It's like a whole page bleeding into the second page, double page spread of Juggernaut uh, emerging, uh, jumping up out of the lake and crashing and destroying that water ski sled um, and throwing Gambit and Bishop off. 
and um, yeah, just a really cool image. The only criticism I have of this is the sound effect. I just don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think we can see uh, that the vehicle they were traveling on is totaled. So Gambit here, he did see Juggernaut coming out of the water, so he's ready to throw those cards at him. And this is the interesting bit of continuity too. It's the first time that Juggernaut and Gambit have ever met. I don't believe we ever met, Marco, says Gambit. The name is Gambit. And Juggernaut just responds, as it just, look, he just puts up his arm to counter those telekinetically, or sorry, kinetically charged cards. That name is almost as dumb as your accent. How about if I just call you loser? And he just flicks Gambit away like a stone, um, skidding across the top of the lake. Is it me skipping across the top of the lake? Is it me, says Juggernaut, or do they not make X-Men like they used to? Uh, let's hope the rest of the team ain't a bunch of panty wastes like these two, or there ain't no way they're gonna be much help against Onslaught. So really cool open border panel there as well at the end of the page. Really great storytelling um, by Madarera um, throughout this issue and in particular on this page. This is kind of comical here, but it also sells the idea that compared to the Juggernaut, Bishop and Gambit, you know, they're just not on his power level. And then elsewhere on the grounds in the um, medical lab, we have the beast examining the evolved, super evolved Wolverine. He's evolved into this feral form in Wolverine in his own uh, title, Wolverine number 100. And, but Bishop, but rather Beast is not Dr. Henry McCoy because Dark Beast from the Age of Apocalypse kidnapped and imprisoned the real McCoy and Dark Beast is, um, is hiding from Mr. Sinister as uh, the X-Men's beast. This is getting ridiculous. He thinks to himself, how much information did my other self, this timeline's Hank McCoy, have in his head? It is as if the X-Men looked to him for everything from battle scenarios, tech support, and medical evaluations to studying the legacy virus. I only chose to pose as the beast in order to best hide from Sinister. How long before I'm found out in the center of the lion's den? So this is pretty, it's kind of comical stuff here. Like his plan, he's under pressure with this plan. And Iceman is putting pressure on him. So what's the diagnosis, Blue? Is Logan's condition just temporary or no? And he thinks here to himself, touch me one more time and I'll kill you. <laughs> Logan says, spit it out, Doc. Best guess. In words of one syllable, I do not have a clue yet. And then he... Uh, hits this button beneath the table with his toe, which when we turn the page, we see that it releases uh, the shackles on Wolverine. Wolverine is like a wild beast now. So he um, speeds away from the medical examination room. Don't sweat it, beast, he says. It ain't like I'm some mindless animal. I'm not without my own resources. So there's a little editorial note there um, that that's a reference to what's going on in the solo title and how Electra is helping him um, with his uh, new transformation. But as he runs out from the lab room, he uh, whizzes by. Really great um, drawing here, really selling the speed at which he's running to those speed lines. Good stuff. Runs past um, Storm. Storm is in a new costume, one that she donned in her miniseries from this period, the 1996 miniseries. Uh, that was, if my memory serves, written by Warren Ellis, but certainly drawn by Terry Dodson. I should let him go, she thinks to herself, and give him time to think. Goddess knows I have had my own problems with late, and that's a reference to her miniseries, and I've chosen to deal with them in my own way. But then she thinks again, such is the burden of leadership. Storm uses her inborn ability to master the very winds to give chase to Wolverine, but she runs into Cannonball, and Cannonball says, look, ma'am, I realize I'm the new kid in the X-Men, but I've been at the school for years and I'm mighty concerned. Um, and he was at the school for years as um, one of the new mutants. We need to talk, Storm, about the professor. So various X-Men now have concerns about the professor, Jean, but also Cannonball now. And then we get a cutaway scene in New Hampshire where Graydon Creed has wowed a crowd of supporters 
um, and he is running for president but he has got his own boss who is Bastian and Bastian is the one with a master plan. I have a plan Creed. Bastian's not ha happy with uh, Creed for having um, okayed an attempted assassination of Senator Robert Kelly. A plan that is much more important than your pathetic grasp for megalomania. Your handling of Senator Kelly's indiscretions classifies as a total disaster. So that was all uh, shown in the previous issue. Consider yourself fortunate that he lived. So Creed is incensed, but Bastian puts him back in, the, back in his box. He says, in the grander scheme of things, Graydon, you're much less than a petulant child. Let's not have this conversation again. And again, great storytelling here. Open border panel at the end, pull back the angle. We've got this bird's eye view on Creed, casting a shadow. He's left alone. Um, he's been silenced by Bastian, who's a much more formidable um, planner than Creed. Creed's bid for the presidency is just one part of Bastian's master plan, whatever that is. Then the lake house, so as I, as I said earlier, this is the marital home of Scott Summers and Jean Grey. So Jean is coming into the house, um, or she's uh, exiting the house rather, and going out onto the uh, veranda or porch that looks out onto the lake. And who's there except for the unconscious, drowned bodies of Gambit and Bishop. Great angles there on these two. And Jean is surprised. A quick side scan indicates they're okay. It could have killed them, says someone off panel. You know that. And of course, who's it going to be once we get past the advertisements and this bullpen bull bulletins as well. You can see there um, the promo art for uh, Jim Lee on Fantastic Four. Nice shot of Namor there. And um, well, I don't know, is this a nice shot of Captain America uh, by Rob Liefeld? But back to the X-Men story. And wow, look at that. That is a tremendous um, upshot of Juggernaut. He looks huge. And actually speaking of Rob Liefeld, it rem reminds me of how big Liefeld drew Juggernaut in X-Force number three and four. This is a Juggernaut of comparable huge size. You can see that Jean Grey barely comes up to his belt buckle. So, seeing as I acted on your basic good faith and all, Marvel Girl, he's, so he's calling Jean by the name she went by the first time, the very first time they met way back in the 60s. And you agree to use your fancy schmancy head powers to give me a hand. Good faith, Marco. Please, I barely hurt him. I'm telling you, I'm a changed man. It's funny stuff. So Jean puts telekinetic bind, or, um, bindings around Juggernaut, but Juggernaut says, I ain't gonna resist you, kid. And she thinks to herself, he's telling the truth. He's not putting up any struggle whatsoever. So he continues to explain himself. It's like I was saying, I ain't here to break up the furniture and tear up the front lawn. So Jean gets down to it and asks him, you know, the operative question, well, why is he there? And I like this. So his, all of his bravado, braggadocio, braggadocio um, ends and he starts stammering, I need, and he's taking breaths there. And then he, he was gonna say, I need help, but he can't bring himself to say that. So instead he says, I'm here to help. That's nice. That's good characterization. But I really, really love that upshot and the spotting of blacks on Juggernaut. It's tremendous. Also, even this uh, reverse angle on Juggernaut where we're looking around his sh um, back and shoulder and a reverse view on his arms there and clenched fist. fist. Um, it's really, really good command of anatomy, cartoon anatomy by Madarara. Good stuff. So Jean isn't, in, isn't basically, you know, isn't impressed. And she says, actually, we were doing fine before you showed up. Um, but if you think you've something to offer, fine, come with me to the professor. And that sets Juggernaut, Juggernaut off. So he starts shouting, for Christ's sake, you flaming haired pinhead. He's my stepbrother, the one I always hated. Um, he's probably the last person in the world I trust. The whole reason I'm here is cause I got the secret of who Onslaught is. Only I can't get to that part of my head. So. Jean, of course, recognizes the name. Tell me, Kane, why am I supposed to believe you trust me any more than the professor? 
So now he shows how much he trusts her. He takes off his helmet, which is the only thing that protects him from telepathic attacks. What does this tell you? He asks her. That's a great shot of him there as well. But, uh, but this is cool too. Just roaring at her. And, um, and like the, the effect of it in terms of like blowing Jean's hair back. That's really good. It's kind of comical cartoony. But it's, it's nice. I like it. Two pages of letters here. Um, everybody really, really full of uh, delight for everything that's going on in the Xbox. There's just this one letter here that I want to read out because I just don't know what to make of it. Dear Xmail, could you please tell me from whom I could purchase X-Men Unlimited number 11 and how much the cost would be? Thanks a million. Some guy in Oxford, uh, North Carolina. Not to worry, Sherry. We got your unlimited info right here. The book should be on sale by the time you read this in most, if not all, comic shops. In fact, it went on the stands on April 23rd and provides you some 64 pages of reading pleasure for the reasonable price of $3.95. Check it out. What on earth is going on with this letter? It's bizarre, completely bizarre. Deep below the Institute, hidden from all eyes, lies Xavier's war room. So this is an interesting little um, sequence as well. Nate Gray, says the professor, the enigmatic X-Man, the only mutant mind to ever transport my telepathic essence from the astral plane. So that's a reference to X-Man number 10. And then he says, you've my eternal gratitude, boy. What I'm about to do, I couldn't have done without you. So we'll learn what is going on here and what all this is about in subsequent issues um, later on in the Onslaught event. But then the door opens and the professor turns off the computer and it's Cyclops. You wanted to see me, he asks. It's another great shot there. Lots and lots of moody blacks on these pages. Everything involving the professor full of these moody blacks and great colors complementing that by Steve Buccellato as well. There are many things I wanted from you over the years, Scott, responds the professor. Look at that evil grin on his face. But in the final analysis, I think it's safe to say you've been a tremendous disappointment as a leader, as a surrogate son, as a friend. Wouldn't you agree? And how is Cyclops going to respond to that? Well, he says, Sir, Charles, what's wrong? Stay calm. Never let your adversary know you're off balance. Don't let him shake you excellent just look at that grin on his face and then his face completely changes into one of fear sweating fear i need you scott to be strong and then he's pulled away it was a telepathic projection computer patch me through to professor xavier wherever he is on the grounds shouts no he doesn't shout it he just asks cyclops or commands cyclops it's an imperative xavier is in his study where he's been for the last 48 hours so and the professor, it would appear, communicates with Cyclops, relax Cyclops, consider this a test from a former instructor to his favorite student. As always, Scott, be prepared for anything. So what's going on here? Was this all um, a, a simulation? Was the professor acting? Or was some part of the professor breaking out here? Was he in two minds? Was there an ambivalence here? What was going on? Again, it's all seeding the big reveal about the true identity of Onslaught. Now we're on the last page, page 22 of the issue. Deeper below the Institute, at a level just above the darkened Morlock tunnels, Jean takes Juggernaut to a special place. It's a place Onslaught showed me in his mind, she says to Juggernaut. It's a psi shielded chamber. This is the Xenox chamber from, um, from the Silver Age. And uh, Jean explains, it's the one place in the world where we'll finally find the answer to the question, who is Onslaught? So there we go. So this is quite a plot driven um, issue. It's all part of this build up in terms of the reveal of who is Onslaught. Um, but nice little moments of characterization as well in the course of the issue and just stellar stellar art by Joe Matarera throughout. So at the end of this, we have an advertisement for the upcoming uh, Marvel Universe event involving Onslaught. 
and you've got a little kind of um, primer here, a guide to some of the key issues and key moments in the build-up uh, to the Onslaught event. So we've got references there to X-Force and X-Men and X-Men 50 again at the end. So a lot of promotion for uh, the upcoming Onslaught event. It is en route and so is the revelation as regards who is Onslaught really. I do hope you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 334. If you enjoyed my review, please like the video on YouTube. It really does help the channel. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.